So we are not that many people, so we can definitely, well, thank you, first of all, thank you all for coming at 5 p.m. today. It's, you know, it's late. There are, I think there is another talk now after this one, so yeah, thank you for that, the speaker as well. Um, so quickly here, I think this is the only talk that is specifically mentioned the keyword inner source in the title which is quite surprising, so then I assume that you're interested in the topic because we are talking about inner source. So um, it would be good to get to know each other, um, you know, to say hello afterwards and so on. Um, yeah, thank you again for, for coming. A bit about me, I'm saying all of this because I'm part of the Inner Source Commons Foundation. So if you have any extra interest on, you know, the community, um, the kind of things we do, I, I, I'll go over it on, you know, not much detail in the next minutes, but uh, happy to discuss with you. There are some other uh, people from the foundation, world running around, active member, Tom, so, well, uh, uh, of course, Guy Martin there has been an active member, not lately, but uh, one of the original, you know, people moving all of this, so it's great. Um, well, yeah, um, the founder, co-founder as well of, of Viterja, we do development analytics in our source consultancy, as for consultancy as well. Um, has been in the, in the business for 11 years now. So we started in 2012 in part of the uh, chaos community as well that we have Nicole back in the room. Uh, <laughs> that we, can, we are happy as well to discuss about metrics and open source metrics and community health. Georg as well is around. So we are a you know, friendly community. Happy to have you on board and the uh, father of a lovely 11 months old boy. So, <laughs> okay, so when, when I started thinking about this, uh, I realized that the title was definitely too long. I'm sorry about that. Um, then, so then I started to remove some words and then I realized that we can cover these four topics in a certain way, right? So uh, definitely this is about inner source metrics. Uh, it's about engineering culture. Um, it's about open source style collaboration, right? And it's about, you know, making decisions based on, on data. So first of all, let's, let's discuss about inner source. Um, so what is inner source? Really uh, quick definition of this is, well, it's about applying the best open source practices out there uh, that we can think of into internal corporations. So that means that we are bringing concepts as transparency, or collaboration to the way a bank may work, right? Or to a way a uh, certain corporations or enterprises are working nowadays. Um, and that means certain things, certain changes. And specifically, we are discussing about the cultural change, but we need uh, to make process and we need tools to enable all of this, right? So we are, we are moving from a scenarios, you know, where there is a strong ownership perhaps in the code with uh, budget discussions, budget restrictions, and we need to put all of those people to collaborate, you know, between them and, and so on. Uh, inner source is not about producing open source. Inner source is about producing uh, proprietary software. But the discussion for today is about how inner source and learning all of this way of doing, uh, you know, software in a more open source way is enabling developers to at least understand how this works outside. Because what we have now in large corporations is that people uh, don't really know what open source is. They don't care because they are in a company that, they, that is asking them to produce software in a certain way. So they, they, do the, they do the job, right? And they are producing really high quality software. The point is that uh, we cannot ignore open source anymore. So then, and, and then large corporations are using and consuming open source once and again. So there is now this, this knowledge gap that people are trying to fill, corporations, enterprises are trying to fill, and inner source is one of those tools that we can use to enable, enable basically, to have a, a, a massive amount of people understanding how to behave in the open and how to do open source in the medium term. Because we need to, you know, we need to start small internally in the company, do, you know, do experiments, try with the with the, uh, with the technology, try with the processes because we need to put processes to work. Uh, you know, create your own your first inner source program office, which might be the parallel discussion for, for an OSPO, open source program office, that I assume you are aware of the term. Um, and the discussion is why is this? So, because corporations or enterprises look like this, so they are silo based, right? So, what we have nowadays is that if you are all across the, the globe, um, 
um, you are producing once and again similar pieces of software. And perhaps from the micro level perspective, if you are working in an agile way, you are really effective and agile and you are producing uh, software according to deadlines, budget, uh, quality standards, etc., etc. But then you realize at the macro level perspective, you know, all around the world, that if you are producing once and again similar pieces of software in different, you know, geographical regions, it happens that the macro, macro level is not, this is not efficient, right? So then how can we take the, the best of both worlds, basically the regional way of working, regional requirements, localization needs, and deal with, you know, or match this with uh, a global set of requirements that we can work together. So there are some good examples here and there. We'll go through some of them later. But going more into the metaphor of the, of the silos, what happens typically is when two teams are trying to collaborate, right? What happens is that, well, first they don't know how to do it, but they are forced to work, to collaborate in somehow. So uh, at the end, what, what happens is what, what we call at the inner source commons, the cheese interface, which is okay, well, you know, you need to go through the path of the holes in the cheese to reach the top level, which is, you know, those aisles that you can see on the top. And they, this is where basically communication happens. So we need to go to the top of the hierarchy, have the discussion, and then it goes down to the hierarchy. And then suddenly both teams did something. Typically what happens is that they, don't, they didn't know how to collaborate, right? They didn't know how to make software together. It just happened that they were forced to do that. Um, so, okay. The question here for the audience is who else out there is producing high quality software in a distributed way all around the world? Okay. The answer, or one of the answers is open source. So we can think about how the Linux kernel is being developed. It's all around the world. Developers producing code together. Uh, I know, OpenStack is another great successful piece of software. Same, right? So there are many, many open source projects that we know, you know, all the CNCF ecosystem may be one of them, of course. Uh, that is being developed in following a certain methodology in a collaborative way, in a transparent way, and then all of those developers and geographically distributed, and even more, we are having competitors, you know, companies that are working together, producing their own business value to their customers, but they are building something together. So what if we try this internally? Uh, it might, in my company, right? So this is inner source, and this is, this is the rationale because of we, have, we have inner source. Okay, in the, in the first line we had inner source metrics, right? So we have this idea that without data, you are just another person with an opinion. And, and that's true. So we need data, you know, to, to, to somehow decide where to go. So I, I really love this cartoon because this is, you know, you have certain perception about how things are working, but suddenly you realize that when gathering data somewhere, you were absolutely wrong on your perception. So basically data says no. Um, and that's important to have this data and, and not having data or metrics as, you know, as a goal is just as another tool that you need to well, make decisions and having that visibility on whatever is happening in your development software cycle is, is key for the success of, the, uh, of any development cycle. Okay, moving forward, engineering culture. I have this hypothesis. Um, basically, is the software produced the quality of the software, a representation of the culture and processes of a company. So probably you are aware of the concept of Conway's law, that well, the architecture of the system is a, a reflection or a mirror of the different teams or departments or companies that are producing that, that piece of software. But if, if the, the quality of the software is, is not that good, is that uh, uh, what, what does it mean from a process perspective? Is, are, are processes broken? It's basically the cultural approach to how developers are working. The engineering culture is not a healthy uh, uh, culture within the corporation. So my hypothesis is that the, it, it, it's somehow related. So basically, uh, there is a certainly low engagement. According, I think it's a, a study from IDC or Forbes. They claim that 70-something uh, percent of the uh, uh, employees in large corporations were disengaged, right? So what is your motivation as a developer to produce software in your company. So do you have enough agency? Do you have enough room to innovate? Do you have enough space to try things, to collaborate with others? Do you have enough room to try, uh, you know, new stuff or new cool technologies? Uh, and then what if even we go into the schema or, or, you know, the structure that we have a lot of outsourced development. So what happens there? You are 
you know, by contract, you are forced to work in a project a certain amount of hours by a certain price. So that's something really hard. And you as a developer, uh, we can, I can say that perhaps development is still somehow creative work, right? It's, 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 is it an engineering? We can discuss about that. Uh, we can apply engineering practices and so on. We, we can discuss about this later if you want. But definitely, this is still a creative work. And developers like to solve problems. Um, so what if we give some more space to those developers, right? So what if we improve uh, you know, the cultural approach or the processes? On, so then we have a more engaged developers in, in all of this journey. So inner source is in somehow all, all about this. Um, and this is a path, so we are not inventing, uh, let's say, anything new. So we are, uh, at the Inner Source Commons, we are basing part of the um, discourse, let's say, on, on, on existing open source communities out there. One way of looking at this might be the Apache way, right? So, um, and this is by the Apache Software Foundation. And what, think of what happens in, in your company or in any, any company if you simply open the communication channels, right? So, um, and by the way, this is this is a, a, a slide that is, is um, inspired by by the work of, of Jean Jack by, by from the ASF. Um, but what happens if um, you open your communication channels? So what happens when you open your communication channels and just start doing things in the open, right? Uh, you will see what others are simply talking about. So let's assume uh, maybe you are using Slack or maybe you are using some. I know, maybe your, any other tool, Mattermost, any of the Microsoft Teams, whatever you are using, uh, but you have access to whatever others are, are writing down. So that is bringing a certain level of transparency, right? Um, because there is transparency in place and we are human beings, we are opinionated people, right? So we all have our own way of thinking about how to solve a problem and so on. Suddenly what you have or you may have is basically collaboration because there might be people that are not part of the project, but they, they may have a suggestion about how to do things or a question maybe about how to improve that, right? Um, so then what is happening here is that suddenly you will have two people from different places, perhaps from different uh, geographical regions, talking together. So they are collaborating, right? And then at some point over the months, perhaps, then we have or we bring to the table the concept of community. So suddenly there are three, four people that, you know, are really uh, interested in new JavaScript framework to develop software. So then they go there and then they know each other. And if, if, if there is at some time a retreat somewhere with all the company, they will go together and see each other and have coffee or a beer. And that's great. So that's the sense of community. That's about how can we enhance that way of working internally in companies, right? Um, and this is open source. This is, so we are here because we like to talk to each other. We like to, uh, you know, to have some food together and have some great discussions. And, and this is open source. Open source is about the people. Um, so inner source is about the people as well and enabling discussions and networking and so on. And of course, the concept of meritocracy, um, you know, there will be a peer, of course, uh, you know, technical leaders or people that are more uh, skilled into communication or marketing or design or development. So those are, you know, they will have certain merits within the company that will raise a and great here, and people will follow that, that person, so on and so forth. So there is, there is a process, right? There are certain principles that we can discuss on inner source. Um, okay, open source style collaboration. So what is open source? Open source is this. If you, if you check these charts here, all of the dots that you can see around, well, you don't see the dots, but you can see some, some, somehow a dot here and then some blue squares around. Uh, so basically each of the dots are developers. There is a connection between that developer and any of the blue squares that you can see. So basically you can see kind of a stars, right? Around here, around here, around here, around here. So there is a connection. If that person committed a, a, a piece of code to that repository, okay? Uh, then it happens that we may have developers that are participating in more, more than one repository, right? So then what we can see here right now is basically people that are participating in different repositories or different projects across, you know, the, the general organizations. Um, and this is open source because all of this data is coming from, from open source projects out there. Um, specifically, any of the following are, okay, so this is, let's say, the shape and size of the Wikimedia Foundation. 
this is the shape and size of the open infra foundation, right? This is the ONF Open Networking Foundation, Chaos Community, OpenSeed, or the Johns Hopkins University that we've been collaborating with there, with the OSPO. So um, you can see that basically in the open source world, it's certainly natural to collaborate with others, to try, right? And then we will identify people that are, you know, more expert in certain technology, that are kind of key in the sense of bridging different communities and so on and so forth. So this is open source. What happens nowadays in corporations is that what the, let's say the representation of this would be isolated stars. So teams are working in an isolated way, not contributing with any, uh, any of the other teams, right? Um, moving forward, so now we go to the discussion of metrics, evidence-driven uh, decisions. Let me check the time. Okay, we're good. Um, so the first question that I have on the table is basically, what are your business goals or what are your cultural goals, right? Depending where, where we want to go. But uh, because if we think about metrics, uh, what we've seen over the years is that people have metrics because it's uh, for the pleasure of having metrics, right? Because they have the technical skills. So then, oh, we can measure now this thing here. We've seen even up to the point that people are using certain metrics uh, to, you know, to be rewarded or to be part of their objectives. But then when you check those metrics with the real business, you know, kind of goals or objectives, there is not a match. So then what is, what, what's the sense of having certain metrics, you know, that are not related to business goals, right? So then the first question probably that we need to discuss here in terms of, you know, a bit of metric strategy is what are your business goals? Because if we, if we have that clear, then we can start, you know, having certain discussion following a goal question metric approach that we are uh, discussing as Georg mentioned before in, in the chaos community, that's a method coming from the eighties. So nothing new on the table, right? But uh, there is a methodology that we, we can follow. And with this, we are sure that we will have the right metrics for the business goals that we have nowadays. Maybe we don't have the metrics. I mean, we don't have the option to calculate the metrics, to gather the data or so, but at least we have identified the metrics that are needed to answer to the business goals. And of course, if we are in a department, a business unit in a regional uh, part of our company, uh, then we will have metrics to say, okay, this is, this is what we have advanced according to the business goal, right? So maybe perhaps you're using OKRs or maybe any other way of measuring um, your success or your advances. But this is, this is a really good way based on our experience to discover and, 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 and match, do this matching between goals and metrics in, in a company. Doesn't matter probably if you are measuring open source or if you are uh, trying to measure success in inner source, but this is, this is one of the options on, on the table. Okay, so why do we need metrics? That's uh, probably part of the next discussion. So the, first of all, and what we've seen is that people don't know who they are. So, uh, and the, the very first thing that we need to know is, okay, how do I look like? It's basically, this is my mirror. This is me from an engineering perspective. This is me from a software development life cycle perspective. This is me from a delivery perspective. And then of course might be, uh, you know, worse than expected or better than expected, but we need to know who we are, where we are in the map, right? Because first we need to understand where we are so then we can move from point A to point B, right? So metrics then are kind of a good guidance to lead a change because we can say, okay, uh, perhaps we are, I don't know, in our, uh, the delivery process, we are, uh, it's taking, I don't know, uh, three days to have the artifact ready to go. And, but we need to know that this is three days, so then we can decrease this down to, to a couple of days. And then we need to know that this is a couple of days, so then we can decrease this again to one day. But then of, according to this, you, know, you need to discuss about, you know, maybe stability of the software production chain. Maybe you need to discuss about having code reviewing process, you need testing, well, there are many things, but you need metrics, you know, to, to have, in control of all of this. So metrics are like flags that are telling you, oh, you are going into the right direction or you are going in the, in the wrong direction, right? But be sure that you are choosing the right metric according to the business goals that you are trying to achieve. And then in the case of inner source, I would say that metrics are quite interesting to motivate people to do certain things. So inner source, uh, uh, going back to the definition of inner source, inner source is, um, 
a lot about moving people to no. not out of their comfort zone sometimes. Because inner source is a lot about um, working in the open. And not everyone feels comfortable about working in the open and in a transparent way. So the point here is that if someone that is not used to produce software that everyone else in the corporation will see, the, the very first thing will be like, no way. So I, I, why, why is this happening, right? They, they, there will be a certain pushback. So how do you do this? So well, metrics might be uh, certainly a good way to, uh, to move into, you know, have that discussion because maybe you can have certain rewarding system in place. You may use metrics uh, uh, to, to simply have a on a table with that person a one-to-one -one discussion like, okay, so you don't have to track that person, but you need to say, okay, what is what you think is good for the project in terms of delivery time, in terms of code review processes, in terms of activity, in terms of, from, you know, from different regions and so on. So what is what is good for the project? And, and if you get to, to you know, the buy-in from the other person, that means that you are describing or defining the metrics uh, from both parts. So both parts are having kind of ownership on that decision. So then it's you know, much easier, right? So then it's not about having um, you know, pointing with a finger like you did this at this time, this day. No, no, no. It's about saying, okay, we as a team you know, can grow together Metrics are good indicators to tell us the right path to go. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's think about now for the whole software development lifecycle. Um, we can think in the first place, well, probably we need to have all the product owners discussing, right? Uh, I want to bring this discussion here because then we'll discuss about some metrics and some of the metrics are you know, part of different, different uh, processes in this timeline. So, well, let's assume we have our, our product owners discussion from different regions and so they are, they are working together. So suddenly you have a new feature request. So then you write down the user story, right? Uh, then at some point you will have uh, probably uh, agile teams with a squad. So then you will, you will develop something. There might be, I know, a pull request. Maybe you are using another way of working as a, a Git flow. So then you have a develop branch. Well, whatever you are using, that's happening. Of course, you have a lot of unit testing. I hope you have a lot of unit testing, please. Um, and then, uh, ideally, with inner source, well, you have certain code review process. Um, suddenly, at some point, after all of this iteration, you will have a merge. So a merge happened, or maybe that process, that pull request, I'm using GitHub terminology here, simply um, is abandoned. Well, there is a ping pong match, right, between both people um, will work. Then you may have a certain uh, CI/CD process. Um, suddenly, a new feature is available. So then, that depends if you are using open source or you are using um, inner source. But well, you have some stakeholder of that tool. So then, uh, this is you know. Then you have the users of of that new feature. Maybe it's an API. Maybe it's an artifact. Uh, I know an, an exact file or something else. It happens that well, there is a process. You know, from the beginning till the end. Where, uh, and it takes certain time. So we can see here certain, certain aspects of this. For instance, how long is taking the code review process? So, well, maybe we need to, we need to go around these, these four steps here and see, okay, well, we have the PR is sent, then it's testing, code review, et cetera, et cetera. But then we may have part of the discussion, which is, okay, how long does it take from idea till this is released to customers? So then we are looking at the whole life cycle from the very beginning, the feature request, till this is delivered to, to, to the customer at the very end in a mobile app, perhaps, right? Maybe you are interested in understanding the stability of the software, so then you are focusing more on this area, CICD, if the artifact, you know, you have a lot of failures when building the software. So there are many, many areas. Um, probably up to that line is software engineering on the left. So then that means that is mainly about applying uh, those good practices that in the open source world are happening, you know, code review, unit testing, uh, have that dis discussion in the open in a transparent way, collaborative way, because this is inner source, remember. And then um, if we moving forward, then we have engineering processes that are mainly the pipelines, right? Pipelines are once they are there, it works. So that's engineering, I agree with you. The previous step, I don't know if this is still engineering, but it, it's part of a creative work with ChatGPT and others. Well, I don't know, it will be. But uh, so far, it's, it's been this, you know, following this process and so on. And then we have the outer world, which is 
the, the rest of the consumers of, of my software. Good. So then uh, we go to some examples or you know, of metrics that might be applicable to the, to the inner source discussion. Um, so first of all, um, what we've seen when uh, working with uh, you know, the inner source commons and talking to people and, and so on is that uh, there is certain lack of visibility about what the teams are producing. Basically, uh, typically what happens is that the management level or chief level, they don't have a clue about what's going on underneath, basically at the development level, who's doing what, when and where. They don't know. And the problem here is that if there is, there are, um, you know, uh, bottlenecks here or there, if there are uh, issues in, you know, in the development velocity of some of the teams, if there are, you know, all of these, those are not clear because people tend to use, for instance, Jira dashboards. But there's something else, there's life beyond Jira, right, if you're a manager. You should, we should go, and the data is there about the Git repositories. So go there and check what's going on. All the pull request interactions, right? So it's about all of this, all of this process. Another business goal might be about fostering collaboration across business units. Remember that we have silos, and we are producing once and again the same piece of software. What if we break down? So it's about how can we foster collaboration across these different business units? Because ideally, we want to have one core of the, that is shared all across the different regions. So then everyone is working there. And then perhaps you have localizations or regional part of your software, of course. But what happens is that, well, we need to foster collaboration. Um, perhaps you want to increase the stability of the software. Perhaps you would like to have a predictable software de delivery process. So there are many questions that we can answer from a more, you know, chief level perhaps about being faster to market. So there are many things that we can discuss. Um, so I, I, I choose some of those, so then we can enter into you know, a certain discussion and then I can show you some, some ideas or some numbers. Numbers are based on, on open source projects. So uh, of course I cannot expose uh, internal data or so, but this is based on, on existing contributions from in, in the open source world. So as I remember, this is uh, GitLab or OpenF, OpenFB back in time a couple of years ago. Um, so the first thing is who is who? So what is the, uh, how are my teams contributing? Okay, so we have, let's assume that we don't have organizations here. We have, you know, department one, department two, department three, department four. And then we have certain metrics that might be part of this discussion. I know, commits, authors, number of touch files, edit lines, projects, repositories, et cetera, et cetera. Good, so if we go here, suddenly we realize that there are certain departments or companies that are producing really Fatty commits, right? So why is this? Is, is it a good software in the air in practice to have a commit of in average of 1,000 lines? That's something that no one can review. So why is this happening, right? So something is happening there. We don't know the reason for this, but something is happening there. So at least we have a pointer now with metrics telling us, okay, here from a software engineering perspective, this is a bad practice. So why is this happening? Let's go and talk to them, right? So now we know that there is a company, whoever it is, that is producing these fatty commits. Okay, that's good. So at least we know that this is happening. And in the same way that we can go for this level of you know, detail, we can go at the same time for other processes. Remember that this is now when the commit is merged in the main branch, right? So now this is information coming, coming directly from the Git repository. If we go a step back, let's say, when uh, basically the merge request, in this case, it was using GitLab. So that's, that's why the, it's not pull request, it's merge request. But uh, instead, of, instead of going directly to the comet, we go a step back and say, okay, let's go to the review process. So then why are these uh, companies here or entities taking that long? So we, we have a difference of even three levels of magnitude. I mean, that's a lot. So why is this difference between this team and this team? So, well, we don't know. Right? And it's, it's not about saying this is good or this is bad, but at least you have the outliers, right? You have probably an average in terms of, you know, closing time or review time or so, but then you have the outliers. And so let's talk to the outliers. Why is this happening? Right? And then probably in, with time you will decide, okay, this is, it's better to move everyone to the left or to the right. So then, sure, let's do that. So then you start slightly, you know, putting certain goals in terms of metrics that are will kind of lead that change that we were discussing before. More things, uh, collaboration. So this is a, an, an old chart from the CNCF plus OpenCF ecosystem. Again, remember that we have the dots that are developers, and then we have here the, the project. So this is Kubernetes, for instance, this is OpenCF, this is Fluent, this is, this is quite old, yeah, three, four years maybe. But um, 
what we can see here is that we have developers, this bunch of developers here that are collaborating here in Kubernetes and here in OpenSea, right? Um, this mess here is collaboration. This is the beauty of open source. All this chaos is beauty. And this is what in inner source we would like to see. We would like to see chaos in you know, this network diagram because that means that people are simply contributing everywhere. Okay? This, is, this is a use case for CNCF that we were doing with, with Red Hat back in time. Um, but, but this is a really great illustration for basically what collaboration means. So this is what we are looking with inner source, collaboration. More things. You can think of maintainability ratios, right? So then what is, uh, how much uh, is, is your team basically closing effectively versus new issues coming to the project, right? So then there is a, a, um, an old metric which is called backlog management index in maintenance, in software engineering in, in maintenance field. That is basically telling you a simple formula, which is, okay, give me the, uh, how many issues or merge requests or so you, your community or your people are able to close versus the, the new things coming. So then basically this is a percentage. So whatever is under 1%, um, you can see this in this chart, this green line here that we follow here. This is time, X axis. This is the, uh, this is this backlog management index or review efficiency index that we call this when, when there is a pull request in place. And when this is, this is under one, which is around this area, this means that basically this 15%, 10%, 5% of the issues or the reviews are simply left there open, right? So basically the community or the team is not able to close things as fast as new issues are coming to the project. That's a maintenance issue. On the other hand, if you, you, we can see the other peaks. So basically that means that they were closing things or reviewing things really fast. So whatever is over one, that means that they are being more efficient. Um, and again, this is something that typically teams, uh, even engineering teams, uh, we've seen that they are not even tracking. So from a project perspective, and if, if I were an engineer, I would like to know this because if we are consistently leaving as open tickets or open, uh, you know, change requests, a lot of things, we have, we have a problem in the development process because there are a lot of issues that are coming. So our backlog keeps growing and there's basically there is a lot of noise and it's, it's like a continuous running process, right? So it doesn't, doesn't make sense. Okay. Uh, yes. So uh, REI is, uh, stands for uh, Review Efficiency Index which is at the same coming from this backlog management index. So review efficiency index is, it, it tries to represent how efficient the team is when dealing with merge request or pull request within review process, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, So the technology, well, we'll go, we can go later for the discussion, but the technology is Grimoire Lab. Um, and then it happens that, uh, yes, Viterdia is commercializing Grimoire Lab as a project. So these specifically were produced by Viterdia because that was OpenFB uh, customer of Viterdia. Hmm? Yeah, you're welcome. Um, well, more stability and so I, I'll go faster because we are running out of time. Um, there are some about the stability. Um, so if you are interested in learning more about uh, inner source or the technology and so on, so innersourcecommons.org. So we have a great set of books that are you know, open to everyone. You can go there, learn about use cases. The adopting inner source contains several use cases there. Uh, patterns are uh, a list of proven solutions to existing problems in the inner source journey, let's say. Uh, managing inner source projects is about metrics and discussion on infrastructure and so on. Understanding the inner source checklist is literally a checklist that you can follow to do things on inner source. And getting started with inner source is the very first book that was released by thanks to PayPal and O'Reilly. Um, um, yep, that was that was it. So innersourcecommons.org slash learn slash books. Feel free to, to join there. There are more uh, materials that you can consume. Learning Path is another great place to start. Short videos, short articles, you can, you can learn, you can consume videos. Um, you can go for, for instance, through the, uh, what we call the Trusted Committer, which is the key central piece for the success of the Inner Source Initiative. 
which is like the let's say the committers in open source world so it's about extrapolating this and bringing this to to inner source world uh, the contributor the product owner well there are there are many of them so I, I really recommend you go through them a bit about a bit more about the inner source commons so there are more than 2,000 people um, uh, nowadays in slack channel more than 600 organizations here and there that have claimed that they are doing inner source and uh, there is this list that you can go for with links to when a company said, hey, we are doing inner source. Um, so you can go there, innersourcecommons.org slash stories. Uh, so yeah, we are very happy to have you on board if you are interested. Uh, there is a Slack channel that you can join. The uh, community is very friendly. Um, there is one rule, by the way, that is to rule all the inner source commons, which is the Chatham House rule. Uh, that means that you can uh, go to the community, talk to the people, uh, but basically no company likes bad press, right? Even good press sometimes. So basically you can use the information out of, outside of the community. You cannot say who said what or the affiliation of that person. That's all, okay? So then you can say things like, oh, I learned at the Inner Source Commons that there are companies that are having this issue. And they have solved that issue following this, this and that, okay? Um, chaos community. Um, uh, it's a Linux Foundation project. We had, we've had, uh, we had indeed on Tuesday uh, the ChaosCon. Uh, it's great, uh, good people there. Um, well, we were discussing about metrics, community health, project health. The tool that I was uh, using to illustrate some of the concepts, some metrics, is Grimoire Lab, which is part of this, 100% open source. Uh, and then what you mentioned, the question to you was, okay, uh, yes, we are taking this tool and, and, and producing the building the software on, on top of this. Um, a bit more in case you are interested in a more academic background of all of this, a couple of papers that might be of interest related to inner source metrics on the one hand, mine, mining software repositories uh, last year, and then the other one is PRT Computer Science Journal, where uh, it's this one is open access, not the other one, where you can have a really detailed view of what Grimoire Lab is and in terms of the components, the actions, the purpose, the mission, etc., etc. Um, and then perhaps the last thought for, well, not the last thought, but the previous one. Um, inner source is, um, so we've been discussing about inner source and we've been discussing about metrics and about open source, right? Um, and the thing is that we are in an open source conference and we said that inner source is basically about building proprietary software and that's true. But suddenly, if we are able to teach, to train people to show the value of working in a transparent way and collaborative way within the corporation or the enterprise, suddenly you have a massive amount of developers that know how to behave in the open because they, they feel comfortable about producing software and being reviewed or review other software or contribute to other teams or talk to people directly or even public speaking because then you will have more engagement across the, the different team members, right? So um, if you are using, I don't know, uh, infras, for instance, GitHub, Literally, you are a one button, one click to say, and now this is open source, because basically all the way of working is already done. All the processes, all the code review, all the unit testing, all the good practices are done. You are doing inner source, right? So you are literally one click to say, and now I do this open source. And that's the beauty of inner source. It's a great path to enable uh, contributors to be open source contributors. And I really believe that this is a, a good opportunity for open source to basically grow massive amount of developers to become open source developers, or at least to understand what that means, right? To behave in that, in that way. Okay, um, last but not least, probably, okay. So we said that at the beginning that without data, you are another person with an opinion, but data is cheap nowadays. So have an opinion, okay, that's all. Okay, and this is all. Well, thank you for your time, and I don't know, questions? Comments? Yeah, thank you. Yep, I can give you this. Yeah. Here you have. So with generative AI, the prediction is that there's going to be a flood of code generated, potentially code committed or uh, put into the stream in terms of uh, pull requests and commits and the like. Do the metrics sort of cease to have value with that onslaught that's predicted, or is that something that you think the metrics can filter out for? 
Mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, yeah, so we are talking about predicting things. That's good. Um, of course, I might, well, I will stay here. I might be wrong, but um, my feeling is, uh, well, first, technology is still not there. So that's one thing, and I would say that technology will help people to become more productive. At the same time, we saw that in the pandemic, right? So we saw like a, a huge increase of noise on the internet, massive increase of noise. People basically move everyone to there. And now basically the, the, the levels of that noise is kind of you know, stable, has not decreased. And with this generative AI, in not only with code, but you know, documentation or, or, or post or you know, thoughts on, on several things, it, it's kind of my expectation that it's going to grow. So can we filter out this? Um, might be, uh, but, but, but I think that we'll need people not to build that much of the blocks or the bricks, but uh, to be sure that what is being produced has reached certain uh, expectations and quality. So what I would like to see is that human beings will talk more to human beings. What I think is becoming is more machines talking to machines. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't have. Uh, maybe others have other opinions here or thoughts. No? It's definitely hard to say. You want? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so one of the things about metrics is if, if I tell you how I will measure you, then that is usually a good predictor of how you will behave. Yes. Because obviously you will try to rig the metrics in a way that it sheds a good light on you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we have experienced this because we implemented some inner source metrics. We were trying to measure how many uh, inner source projects we have per department, mm -hmm. right? Um, so we had, yeah, every department, how many, how many repositories do you have that are open for inner source? And these metrics were reported to executive management and then what happened was that um, departments just opened up their, their uh, repositories for inner source without actually intending to do inner source with these repositories. Mm -hmm. But so it would have a nice number. And yeah. then when, when uh, a project was going on in two or three departments, you know, they would fight about which department gets the number for this mm -hmm. project. And so forth and so forth, right? So we we that didn't really help at all, and we abandoned these these metrics. Yeah. So my question is, any thoughts how you could kind mm -hmm. of prevent mm -hmm. this? Well, I would say if, if I were in a company where uh, people are fighting to open the repositories and fighting to say this is mine, that's good, but at least for a few weeks, right? So then I think metrics are useful to you know, you know to to drive a change, and then when this is done close that choose uh, go for another place that's that's one of the that's one of the suggestions I would do the other one is if you are uh, tracking people for a certain purpose then probably you need to bring those people on the table to have that discussion so then is what you said is if I'm using a metric to track you then you'll you'll change your behavior but the discussion here is hey Wolfgang you and me we have a problem how do we track this so then it's now you and me discussing about that problem there. So then it's about taking both ownership of whatever we discussed. Mm -hmm. And then it's, and maybe we were wrong and we need to change slightly the metric, but then it's, it's again a conversation. So that would be the other way I, I've seen it works. Yeah, but I think that's good. I mean, it wasn't actually used to, you know, you get a bonus if you have more, more uh, mm -hmm. inner source repositories, but it was interpreted that way. Yeah. And it's like, oh, we just need to satisfy and then, you know, look good and so forth. And it's like, no, that was not the intention. Mm -hmm. The intention was just to see if it's working at all to have people do inner source. And, okay, good. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. More? Yeah. Did you go back? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I had a question on your smile slide when you are talking about motivation yes. um, and getting people to adopt into this idea. Um, Within certain teams, you have a lot of diverse backgrounds. Um, and in my personal experience, I had a lot of difficulty actually clicking commit. Like someone else clicked it for me for my first like mm -hmm. 10. So 
um, I'm wondering if that would be a good um, location to insert some mentorship or apprenticeships for mm -hmm. practice once you are starting to use InnerSource, um, or if that would just kind of add complexity to the whole onboarding. So that, that, that's a very good point. Um, so the, um, the role, so we, we haven't discussed a lot about trusted committer. The trusted committer is a person that is trusted by management. That person can you know, talk the lingo of, of management and can talk the lingo of the people, of the technical people. But that person is in the same way that in open source communities we have trusted committers that are mentoring and helping others to grow into the project. This is, this is basically, the ex we can copy the rule basically. So ideally, yes, we would have trusted committers that are people that are willing to help others because the goal of the trusted committer is not to review everything. The goal, if I, if I were a trusted committer, I would expect to have other trusted committer to do my job. So my, 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 my medium term goal is to grow others so then we can be you know, more people basically doing that job. So yes, mentorship would be one of the key uh, 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 you know, responsibilities of the trusted committer, I would say. And is that something that metrics could reflect? Um, okay, with, uh, so that depends. If we want to go for something really accurate in terms of data, um, not always. So for instance, we've done, we've done mentorship analysis for, that was, um, uh, yeah, Outreach and Google Summer of Code uh, a few years ago on the Linux kernel. So basically we had all the data about the, all the processes, reviews, da, da, da. Um, and then what we were looking for was, as the list of people were public, we were looking for them. We were, the question we had on the table was, are people that were mentored uh, initially as engagement uh, retained for a longer time? The answer was initially yes, although we didn't did this in a more scientific, let's say, uh, perspective. But um, uh, we knew that because there was a list of people that were listed as, oh, these are mentors in this project. So it was a matter of looking for them. Internally in a company, if you're using GitHub or others, you may have certain labels. So taking you as, as mentoring, you can work around, you know, or infer if that person is a mentor by, you know, going to, Okay, first contributor, we know that when a first contribution happened. So then we can look for the person that basically reviewed this. Right? And then we can say, is this a mentorship process? Well, you either go there and read or you assume that the answer is yes. Um, and see about, you know, cycles, discussions, and so on. Cool, great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, no, you go. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know how much time we have. Okay, I think we are out of time. Might we? Okay, well, thank you all for your time. Thank you. Oh.